motion to order the regular Board of Education meeting for Indian Prairie School District 204 on Monday, May 13th, 2019. Jackie, will you please call the roll? Mr. Karubas? Here. Mr. Raysack? Here. Ms. Peel? Here. Mr. Rising? Here. Ms. Deming? Present. Ms. Grover? Here. Ms. Donahue? Here. We do have a quorum. Mr. Karubas, will you lead us in the pledge? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We have many board salutes today. Ms. Grover, will you please start us out? Sure. The board salutes Nico Valley senior Anuva Chandelier, who was recently named a U.S. Presidential Scholar. Anuva is one of only 161 students chosen from across the country to receive this prestigious honor. U.S. Presidential Scholars are selected based on outstanding academic performance. Anuva named Nikwa Valley teacher Dr. Elizabeth Hobbs as her most influential, influential educator. For this honor, Dr. Hobbs received the U.S. Presidential Scholars Program Distinguished Teacher Award. Congratulations, Anuva and Dr. Hobbs, on these stellar achievements. Thank you. Mr. Rising? The board salutes 39 District 204 students who advanced to the Skills USA State Competition. Wabonzi Valley took home 22 medals this year, including 13 gold, 5 silver, and 4 bronze medals. Nequa Valley took home a total of 14 medals, including three gold, three silver, and eight bronze medals. And Matilla Valley took home one gold, one silver, and one bronze medal. First place winners at the state competition will move forward to the national competition in June. Congratulations to all these students for their success at the Skills USA State Championship. And do you have another? I do have another. Uh, the board salutes seven District 204 high school seniors who were recently named 2019 National Merit Scholars by the National Merit Scholarship uh, Corporation. The scholars are Svanik Tandon from Matia Valley High School, Sean Fu, uh, Jeffrey Tang, and Mag Megan Wu from Nikwa Valley High School, and Shruti Kali from Wabanzi Valley High School. These scholars were chosen from more than 7,600 finalists. Each student will receive a $2,500 scholarship. Congratulations. We congratulate all our National Merit Scholars on their selection for this prestigious award. Thank you. Ms. Donahue? The board salutes Kendall Elementary LMC Director Rhonda Jenkins on being featured in the article Tech Leaders, Amplifying Reading and Research. In School Library Journal, the article highlighted Rhonda's use of book reports to introduce tech tools and the idea of skills transfer to her students while encouraging them to make good choices in their digital lives. Many congratulations to Rhonda. And one more? I do have another. The board salutes Hill Middle School for being redesignated as an Illinois Horizon School to Watch by the Association of Illinois Middle Schools. There are only 24 middle schools in Illinois and approximately 400 schools in the nation that carry this distinction. Crone Middle School, Granger Middle School, and Gregory Middle School are also Horizon schools. To receive this honor, schools must demonstrate social equity, academic excellence, developmental responsiveness, and organizational structures and processes designed to support a path towards excellence. We congratulate Hill's principal, Mike Dutt Dutt, and his staff and students for this impressive designation. Thank you. Mr. Karubas. The board salutes the District 204 students who participated in the 26th Annual High School Video Festival, sponsored by the Chicago Midwest Chapter of the National Academy of Television Arts and Sciences and the Midwest Media Educators Association. District 204 students participated along with over 830 high school television students from 42 high schools across northern Illinois, southern Wisconsin, and northwest Indiana. Matea Valley secured three top honors, Wabonzi Valley earned two top honors, and Nequa Valley was awarded nine top honors. In addition, Nequa Valley seniors Christine Corbin received the Student Television Award 
for Excellence in the Short Form Nonfiction category, and Megan Kozak was awarded the $1,000 Lucas Palmero Scholarship from the Midwest Media Educators Association. Congratulations to all these students. Thank you, Ms. Peel. Okay. <clears throat> the board salutes Wabonzi Valley teacher Millie Shepich for being honored with the Lifetime Achievement Award by the Illinois School Health Association. This award is presented to an individual who has significantly impacted the Illinois School Health Association throughout their career. Millie was chosen as a dynamic and effective educator who has impacted the health and wellness of countless high school students. Additionally, she has mentored and supported health educators entering the field and inspired them to be their absolute best. Congratulations, Millie, on this well-deserved award. Is she encouraging nurses to come back to the district? Mm. <laughs> we hope. <laughs> Ms. Deming. Coca-Cola scholarship awarded to Nequa student. Congratulations to Nequa Valley senior, Breka Eyer, who won a prestigious national Coca-Cola scholarship award. Coca-Cola scholars are well-rounded, bright students who not only excel academically, but are also actively involved in their schools. These leaders are passionate and service-oriented and demonstrate a sustained commitment to bettering their community. Reka named social studies teacher Kat Beischer as her most influential educator. For this honor, Kat received the Coca-Cola Foundation's 2019 Joseph B. Whitehead Educator of Distinction Award. Congratulations both to Reka and Ms. Beischer. Thank you. I think that's it. It's May. It's a busy yes. celebratory season. Mm -hmm. And we now go to our student representative report. We have Joe Bell Murray with us from Matia Valley High School. She looks, she has her <laughs> replacement. Welcome, Joe. <laughs> Good evening, I'm Joe Balmuri. I've been the student representative from Matia Valley for the past year. Um, I will be graduating in a couple of weeks, so this is my last meeting. Um, I wanna thank the board for giving me the opportunity to speak at these meetings and for being so thoughtful and listening. Um, Dr. Sullivan, congratulations on retirement after next year, enjoy it. Um, and Brooke here will be replacing me for the next couple of years. Um, she is only a sophomore right now, so she will be doing these for the next two years, and you'll be able to hear from her. Thank you so much once again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Brooke Figgies, and I am the class of 2021 Executive Board Representative for Matias Valley Student Government, and I am very excited to join you tonight and take over for Joe for the next two years. Matia held its annual World Language World Language Week the week of March 18th, and it was great to see the multicultural aspect of Matia be represented. We hosted our second day of life this school year. Students from all segments participated and collaborated to create a positive school climate. They were able to listen to speakers, engage in group activities, and focus on communication, problem solving, and team building. During the week of April 29th, we held our annual Matia Mental Health Matters Week, during which students were encouraged to focus on their mental health and self-care habits through student-led discussions in the classroom and relaxation activities during PE. An AP season is underway. Students have been testing for the past week and will continue to do so throughout this week as well. We wish all of our exam takers the best of luck. Last week, the PTSA helped the student body create the best staff in the land, celebrate the best staff in the land with the Teacher Appreciation Week. Students thank their favorite teachers and mentors with messages and treats. I'd like to recognize the Matia Valley Theater Department for putting on a great production of Newsies last weekend, May 2nd. Another great show and well done to the cast, crew, and pit. Seniors were recognized last Tuesday, May 7th at the Black and Gold Awards Night, where we had 276 seniors spotlighted for being Illinois State Scholars, graduating with honors, receiving scholarships, and for their service to the MVHS community. Each department selected an outstanding senior and four Matia Life winners were picked to be honored. I'd like to congratulate Connor Murphy, Grace Buckta, Cameron Anderson, and Joe Balmieri for winning life this year. We'd like to wish all of our seniors well on their future paths. That is all I have for the May Board Report. Thank you, everyone, and until next time, go, go Mustangs. Thank you. Joe, before you go. 
Why don't you tell us what your plans are for next year? Um, I'm actually still picking between schools and between the University of Southern California and New York University. Congratulations. Thank you for all your work for us. Thank you. It's now time for public comment for non-agenda items. If you are here to speak to an agenda item, that comment will be taken immediately prior to that item. 30 minutes is allowed for public comment and each person is limited to three minutes. When addressing the board, we ask that you respect the confidentiality and safety of our students and school district personnel. We ask that those addressing the board be cognizant that this is an open meeting and is available to all age groups. And as such, ask that you consider who the audience members are this evening and keep comments age appropriate. Public comment represents the voice and opinion of the speaker. There will be no f feedback from board members during the meeting, but follow-up will be provided by an administrator as appropriate. Uh, we have two speakers for non-agenda items. My, first is Mike Shavini. Hi, Mike. Yeah, up here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Welcome. Thank you very much. Actually, I'm, I'm here to speak um, about uh, lacrosse, actually, as a district sport. And I'd actually like the board to consider reconsider the parent funding of lacrosse. And we're just really, in the end equation, just looking for equal treatment as uh, as it pertains to some of the other sports like football, baseball, basketball, as it relates to funding going forward. So I guess what I'd like to do is, is just start out by saying, once again, my name is Mike Shavini. I actually have two players at Nequa Valley, both on both the men's and the women's team. And uh, I'd like to offer, a, I guess, a slightly different perspective maybe for the board to consider, which is with sports these days, I, I've actually observed that sports participation in some ways is starting to actually wane through the district. And what I mean by that, it really pertains to perceptions regarding safety, but also specialization. In the district, uh, five years ago, my oldest son actually played on the, uh, uh, the Nequa Valley football team. And at that time as a freshman, there were well over 100 participants actually on the team. This last year, that number was down to 30. Then when you look at, so that's perhaps addressing the safety side of the equation and some perceptions there. But when you look at specialization, I also know of a couple kids recently that have decided not to play baseball anymore because they can't commit to the year-round training that a lot of other kids are committing to to participate in the sport, so they can't match up against the competition. So when you start to look at this particular situation and kids may be drifting away from sports, Lacrosse is a legitimate alternative for them to consider. Um, the district, I think, just needs to recognize maybe some of these trends regarding, you know, the sports and making sure that there are affordable alternatives for kids to participate in. And I, I guess by way of an example, I would offer up, um, some people would probably say, look, there's a lot of sports actually for kids to participate in. There's men's and women's tennis. There's men's and women's soccer. There's men's and women's you know, softball and baseball. But once again, going back to specialization, the fact of the matter is, is that a lot of kids just, if you like to play a little bit of basketball, you can't really expect to go ahead and make one of the District 204 teams and find your way to the court. It's just not a realistic situation. Whereas lacrosse is a completely different situation. And I can point to my own daughter and one of her closest friends as an example. As a freshman, she had never played lacrosse before. She decided that she wanted to give it a try and so she got the off-season training program, and she and her friend, they made it a point to try to get in shape, went to the tryout, made the team, worked hard at the practices, and they found their way to the field. Uh, and they had an absolutely fantastic time. And she's going to continue to play that sport now for the next four years. Well, I should step back. She's a sophomore now, so she's playing it now as a sophomore. We expect that she'll play it as a junior and as a senior. But candidly, uh, the parent funding side of the equation, I think, is something, once again, that I'd go back to and ask you guys to reconsider. We're actually fortunate enough to allow her to try something like this. But men's lacrosse right now, I think, costs somewhere in the range of $900 at, at NEQA, and that doesn't include the cost of equipment. 
And then the women's side of the equation, I think, is approaching $700 and, once again, doesn't include the cost of the equipment. So when Mike, you really – I yeah. have to stop you. If, mm -hmm. if you can – one or two sentences because it's a three-minute limit. Okay. I guess the way that I'd just like to wrap it up is, is that, look, at, at $900 plus for men's and $700 plus for women's, it's not a viable alternative for so many families. I mean, that's just a reality. And so I think in closing, I would ask that the actual board reconsider the idea of parent funding and perhaps look to contribute more funds towards the sport because it's a great alternative for kids and it's something that kids can pick up relatively easy as opposed to some of the other sports that require a lot of specialization. Thank so, you. Thank you very much. And next speaker is Tim Stensby. Welcome. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you to the board for having us tonight. Um, I'm uh, following <coughs> Mike Shavini's, um with regard to lacrosse for District 204. Um, wanted to spend a few minutes just to um, talk a little bit about a story that um, resonated me, with me this year specifically since I've got three minutes. Um, my oldest son is a senior at Wabonzi Valley High School. He's a four-year varsity letterman in lacrosse. My middle son is a sophomore. He plays on JV as well as varsity. And my 12-year-old uh, plays for the Fox Valley lacrosse program here in Naperville. And <clears throat> the sport itself, lacrosse over the last, let's say, five or six years has just blown up as far as um, accessibility to a lot of kids. And so you're seeing the programs explode all across Naperville. And everywhere we go across the suburbs and play the suburbs, um, you're seeing the same type of passion. See a lot of kids playing it from all different ages, from five, six years old, all the way up into, of course, 18 um, in the youth programs. And so I explain this because as we go, as we go across the, the Midwest and watch other teams explode and, and have the quantities they do, it's, it's all about the accessibility to be able to play a sport that is on a, on a grass field and have two nets and some lines and some referees. My oldest son, again, who's a senior, he's graduating this year from Obanzi Valley, spent near six months recruiting kids who had not played the sport uh, this year and had recruited close to 10 other athletes, football players, um, track athletes, um, et cetera, and was so excited to come to his head coach in um, the early season, in, actually in December, and tell him the, the story about how he recruited these football players that were wide receivers, running backs to a new sport. And again, all about expanding that sport, getting it to other, other kids who had not played it before. Um, so it came down to when we received the, the invoice, um, and the invoice was just north of $900 per player that the cost became unaffordable to those players. And so back to the accessibility, back to the, trying to continue to grow the sport, I think it's, it's the districts, um, we, we, want, we believe that the districts should take a second look at the cost. Um, and from a subsidy perspective, we know there's lots of sports that have to be um, to, uh, played. There's, there's female as well as male, male sports out there. Or as far, sorry, female as well as male uh, lacrosse teams. So there's the equality there from a male and female sport as well. Um, but all we're asking is you guys can reconsider the cost. Um, you know, again, it's, it's one of those things where $900 for the average family is an extremely amount of, extreme amount of money to play a sport that really doesn't require a court, a rink, um, there's, there's nothing specific that has to be, you know, lend, if you will, to be able to play the sport. Um, so we'd like to ask you to reconsider the cost um, as you guys go forward, and I thank you for your time. Thank you. Thanks. We now move to our superintendent report and consent agenda portion of our agenda. We always begin with our superintendent report. Okay. All right, this is uh, National Prevention Week, which is an annual health observance dedicated to increasing public awareness of mental health and substance use. And in recognition of this week, our schools are doing something different for the first time this year. Student members of 360 Youth Services Youth Advisory Council created 30 unique positive message cards. And thousands of these cards with encouraging messages will be distributed at our high schools this week with each student receiving their own their very own positive message. So we appreciate our partnership with 360 Youth Services and the Community Alliance for Prevention for leading this project. Um, Saturday, May 18th, is the 33rd Annual Fine Arts Festival hosted at all three of our high schools. This annual festival showcases, showcases the talents of 9,000 students throughout the district, featured in 80 musical performances and 12,000 pieces of art. Uh, the Fine Arts Festival is free. Um, and open to the public, so we encourage the community to drop by at any of our high schools between 9 and 4 o'clock. 
um, on Saturday. There's a detailed schedule of all the performances on the website. Um, and this event is funded by the Indian Prairie Educational Foundation with some additional support through a grant from the city of Naperville. I will be at each building, um, each of the high schools, to receive the National Association of Music Merchants Best Community Free Music Education Award for the seventh year in a row and the eighth time in the last nine years for our district. Um, Indian Prairie is one of only 13 districts in the, in the state to receive this award. U.S. News & World Report released its rankings of the 2019 Best High Schools, and the annual list is compiled after reviewing data from more than 17,000 public high schools, including 647 in Illinois. Um, all three District 204 high schools were ranked in the top 5% of high schools in the nation. Neuqua Valley ranked 394 in the nation and 19th in the state. Matia Valley was 588 in the nation and 29th in the state, and Wabonzi Valley ranked 851 in the nation and 39th in the state. And according to U.S. News, the highest ranked schools are those whose students excelled on state tests and performed beyond expectations, participated in and passed a variety of college um, level advanced placement exams, and had high graduation rates. So congratulations to all three of our high schools. And this is the last board meeting before graduation ceremonies on Thursday night, May 23rd at 7 p.m. We will hold graduation ceremony at Indian Plains High School, for the last time in the Indian Plains High School building. And then on, Saturday, on Sunday, May 26th, our three high schools will hold their graduation ceremonies at the Northern Illinois University Convocation Center. Neuqua Valley starts us off this year at 9.45 a.m., followed by Matia Valley at 2, and then Wabonzi Valley at 6. So wear comfortable shoes, everyone. All ceremonies will begin at their scheduled time, and for those who aren't able to attend, we will be live streaming the ceremonies, um, so please check our website for the information. So I know that day is something that we all look forward to, and it's a long, long day, but a rewarding one when we see our students cross the stage. So with that, we actually have four administrative positions and people waiting very patiently out in the audience for those, so I'd like to move to those if that's okay with you. Board President Ray Yes. Jack? Yes? Okay. The first is for our Director of Elective Curriculum. So I see my friend Grant there. I'll have Grant stand. So with Al Davenport's move to the principalship, um, Brian Giovannini has moved into Al's position, and that opened the, up this director position. So our candidate is Grant Saar. Hi, Grant. Grant has been our Fine Arts Coordinator since 2013. 15 and prior to coming to District 204 he was the Fine Arts Department Chair at Barrington High School and I think you had a stint at Westmont before that as well, correct? Grant has really excelled in his current position and we really look forward to um, having him take on this role and being with us full time, right Grant? So I respectfully ask for you to approve Grant Sar as Director of Elective Curriculum. Thank you. I need a motion that the Board of Education approve Grant Sar as Director of Elective Curriculum. I move that the Board of Education approve Grant Sar as the Director of Elective cu Curriculum as presented. Do I have a second? Second. I have a mo uh, motion and a second. Um, any discussion? Hearing none, Jackie, call the roll, please. Ms. Donahue. Ms. Donahue? Aye. Mr. Karubas? Yes. Ms. Peel? Aye. Ms. Deming? Aye. Mr. Rising? Aye. Ms. Grover? Yes. Mr. Rasak? Aye. Motion passes. Congratulations, Grant. Congratulations, Grant. <laughs> Next is our assistant principal for Granger Middle School, and our selection is Sherry Fredericks. There's Sherry. She's standing up. Sherry is currently serving as a student services coordinator at Welch Elementary School, and prior to this position, Sherry had many years of middle school um, teaching experience right here in 204 at both Scullin and Gregory Middle Schools. So I respectfully ask for you to approve Sherry Fredericks as assistant principal at Granger Middle School. And I need a motion to approve Sherry as assistant principal. I'll make a motion the Board of Education approve Sherry Fredericks as assistant principal at Granger Middle School as presented. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Hearing none. Jackie? Mr. Rising? Aye. Ms. Peel? Aye. Mr. Rasak? Aye. Ms. Grover? Yes. Ms. Deming? Aye. 
Mr. Carubas? Yes. Ms. Donahue? Aye. Motion passes. Congratulations. Congratulations, Sherry. <laughs> Sherry, do you have a fan club with you? You want to introduce your fan club? All right, congratulations, welcome. Okay, next is the assistant principal at Scullin Middle School, and our selection is Courtney DeFiore. How did I do, Courtney? All right, Courtney, Courtney comes to us from Plank Junior High in Oswego, where she currently serves as assistant principal. Courtney has taught at the elementary level in Oswego and at the middle school level in Aurora. We look forward to welcoming her to Indian Prairie, and I respectfully ask you to approve Courtney DeFiore as assistant principal at Scullin Middle School. And I need a motion to approve Courtney DeFiore as assistant principal at Scullin. I move that we approve Courtney DeFiore as principal at Scullin Middle School. Assistant. As assistant oh. Pro oh, you just got you just got a promotion. <laughs> 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 Ooh, I'm sorry. We I moved fast in 204. Have you, have you heard that? <laughs> you never know. Um, I'm sorry about that, Mr. Uh, Mr. President. I um, move that we approve <laughs> um, her for assistant principal at Scullin Middle School, please. Second. <laughs> Motion and second. Any discussion? Hearing none, Jackie, please call the roll. Ms. Deming? Aye. Mr. Rising? Aye. Mr. Carubas? Yes. Mr. Rasak? Aye. Ms. Donahue? Aye. Ms. Grover? Yes. Ms. Peel? Aye. Motion passes. Congratulations. Welcome to Indian Prairie. Yes. <laughs> and finally, we have the assistant principal at Neequa Valley High School. And our selection is Melissa Wilson. Melissa's standing up there. Melissa has been teaching at Neequa Valley since 2008 when she came in as a substitute and never left. <laughs> she started teaching English, took an English teaching position, um, and then in 2013 she became one of our instructional technology coordinators at NEQA. We're really excited to see her move into the administrative ranks and I respectfully ask you to approve Melissa Wilson as assistant principal at NEQA Valley High School. And I need a motion to approve Melissa as assistant principal at NEQA Valley. I move that the board approves Melissa Wilson as assistant principal at Neequa Valley High School. We have a motion, a second? Second. Any discussion? Jackie. Ms. Grover? Yes. Ms. Peel? Aye. Mr. Rasak? Aye. Mr. Carubas? Yes. Ms. Deming? Aye. Ms. Donahue? Aye. Mr. Rising? Aye. Motion passes, congratulations. <laughs> Congratulations, Hello. Melissa. Thank you. you have a fan club too you can introduce? Besides all the Nequa people <laughs> we see over there. Congratulations. Congratulations. All right, that's it for me. Consent <laughs> agenda. I need a motion that the Board of Education approve consent agenda items H through R. I move that the Board of Education approve consent agenda items H through R as presented. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Hearing none, Jackie, please call the roll. Mr. Carubas. Yes. Ms. Donahue. Aye. Ms. Grover. Yes. Ms. Demi. Aye. Mr. Rising. Aye. Ms. Peel. Aye. Mr. Rasak. Aye. Motion passes. We're now moving to our action items. It's a party in the lobby. Take a moment. <laughs> Thank you. And I need a motion that the Board of Education approve the School Resource Officer Agreement with Aurora as presented. Make a motion that the Board of Education approve the School Resource Officer Agreement with Aurora as presented. Is there a second? Second. Mr. Akirius. Great. Thank you, Board of Education. Um, 
Uh, this uh, SRO process has been gone, going for quite some time. Um, our last actual signed by both Village and us agreement was 2000. Um, I did come back to you uh, in 2017. Um, I think I informed you in February and then it actually came to the board in March um, in which you approved it. We were working with the attorney and the team um, in Aurora. We sent it off after we approved it and we never uh, received any response from them, nothing signed back or anything at that time. Um, back uh, early uh, in 2018, we had been contacted by a different uh, attorney um, from Aurora um, with wanting to move forward with an SRO agreement. We said, well, we approved and sent forward and they don't know exactly what happened. That attorney was no longer there and so on. Uh, when they sent this back, they, it actually was an, uh, an agreement that they sent out to us as well as the other two Aurora school districts. And um, it had included crossing guard information with it at the time. So we did a lot of work with them. We went back and forth on many things. Um, we, do, um, we are sitting here now with an agreement that we um, uh, um, feel good about. Um, to finally have an actual agreement with them. And we do feel like this is gonna go to their uh, next meeting and also have approval from uh, the city of Aurora on this and that we'll get an actual signed one um, back so that we have an updated <laughs> SRO agreement actually in place. We're feeling confident. So um, with that, um, if there's any questions on the agreement, I'd be glad to answer that. Questions? I just have a quick one and, and thank you. I know there were a few questions on this and I can't remember if it was asked, but um, it, at the middle school, is this consistent what we had at the middle school before with one third, one third, one third? Because I feel like our SROs at the middle school level maybe were a half and a half. Is that no, this has been the consistent okay. with what we've had in place. Okay. So, right. um, and the financial agreements have been what we've had in place. Those have kind of, you know, shifted, but um, over the years, but this is consistent with what our current practice is. Okay, because I was just worried about coverage, but it sounds like it's similar to what we've had, so that's fine. Okay. Mr. Uh, Parent, what, what about um, for our, the balance of our um, middle schools? Is it the same coverage? Um, for, uh, you mean the ones that are yes. in Naperville? Um, I'm, okay. <laughs> Mr. Hillman, thank you. With having four middle schools in uh, Naperville, we have two and two. Um, with having three in Aurora, we end up splitting the time between all three. Having another person that we would split to be able to make them half time at one of our buildings and then half time somewhere else would probably be problematic and difficult to be able to manage and pull off. So this has historically been the split with three assigned to the Aurora schools, sorry, one SRO to the three Aurora schools and two SROs to the four Naperville schools. Uh, other questions? I think it's, I don't have a question but a comment. I think it's important to point out that we've had student resource officers since the beginning of the district. And we've had agreements with the cities since then and we have a, an agreement like this with Naperville. So we are updating the agreement that we have in place to yes. set expectations on both sides. And I think it's important to point out that we are using police officers and not private security um, to help us with uh, monitoring our schools. So I think uh, I'm very positive um, a program of what we do and I, Look forward to su supporting this. Anyone else? Hearing none, Jackie, please call the roll. Mr. Rising? Aye. Ms. Pia? Aye. Ms. Grover? Yes. Ms. Donahue? Aye. Mr. Rasak? Aye. Mr. Karubas? Yes. Ms. Deming? Aye. Motion passes. Thank you. Next item is, I need a uh, motion that the Board of Education approve the crossing guard agreement with Aurora as presented. I move that the Board of Education approve the crossing guard agreement with Aurora as presented. Second. I have a motion and a second. 
Mr. Hercarius. Great. Um, this one was a little bit more interesting. As I said, they <laughs> actually had this incorporated into the SRO agreement because um, they've been providing crossing guards to the Aurora schools, um, but we have not received ours. We have not received any crossing. We, the last ones we had were at Gombert and Young, but that was at least two years ago. Um, so when we first talked about it, they um, seemed to be a little bit unaware of that. Um, and they also um, have um, crossing guard shacks for the school districts as well. It's actually on um, a parkway that we have to maintain anyway. It's sitting there, kind of looks like a phone booth. It's on an area where we have to take care of the um, you know, grass and those types of things anyway. Um, they really want to be kind of out of the crossing guard business, so they're saying that they would provide, and we, we are supposed to do crossing guard training for our crossing guards, that they would provide that for two years. Um, and if you see in the agreement, it says for all um, district crossing guards. This past year, actually, Mike Anders provided um, that training for all of our crossing guards, uh, but they're saying that they're offering it. Um, in my conversations with Mr. DePaul, we're most likely... Um, uh, not going to still have the crossing guard shack there. So. Questions, comments? So essentially we're keeping all our hiring practices the same. Okay. So, I mean, because just I know a few crossing guards. Right. We could like, take okay. advantage of basically free training for two years from the Aurora Police for our crossing guards. Okay. They just really wanted this to be consistent with the other school districts. Yeah, right? they're they're moving across. away from providing crossing. The other school districts, I think, have gone a little bit longer with depending on Aurora placing their crossing guards there, um, and so they wanted to be consistent across. Um, all three of their school districts. Th they might still have an SRO and crossing guard in the same agreement for those two districts. I'm not sure. We said we wanted that separated in ours. It didn't make sense for us. So, Anyone else? Jackie, please call the roll. Mr. Carubas? Yes. Ms. Peel? Aye. Mr. Rasak? Aye. Ms. Deming? Aye. Mr. Rising? Aye. Ms. Donahue? Aye. Ms. Grover? Aye. Motion passes. One more to go. You're still here, Doug. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and that is, I need a motion that the Board of Education approve the reciprocal reporting agreement with the City of Aurora as presented. I'll make a motion that the Board approve a reciprocal reporting agreement um, as presented. Second. Motion in a second. Mr. Acarius. This is one we've been looking to make sure we had in place. Um, we also proposed this back in 2016 for Naperville, but it was not um, uh, approved on that side. So actually after this, we'll also be, um, we have reached out to Naperville to want a similar agreement, almost identical to this one with um, the city of Naperville. Um, it's important that we do um, have um, this agreement that says we can share specific information um, between um, um, the city of Aurora and uh, with specific people in the city of Aurora with the police department as well as with um, identified individuals in the school district. It is limited information that can be shared, um, but it also allows for uh, the emergency release of student records at times, which we have a, um, a process that we follow for that as well. So. Questions? There's a lot of reporting you got to do here. <laughs> uh, my only uh, comment is uh, kind of question the longevity of some of, of the document because there's a lot of references to statutes. Right. And they, they often change the law in Springfield. Yes. <laughs> That's it. I think that's been some of the challenges of actually getting the reciprocal reporting agreements in place. There was major changes in 2013 to kind of limit the scope of the reciprocal reporting agreements. Um, I actually was trying to go back and forth with, there's a good guidance document, well, kind of, um, from the, um, I think, a, um, Illinois Council of School Attorneys that I was trying to follow back and forth with it to make sure we were in good shape. Um, you know, I'm happy that this has kind of been a long journey to try to get these. I'm hoping that Naperville, um, it sounds like they've been wanting to make sure we get one in place as well. So I'm hoping we have a, a almost identical document with the city of Naperville. We're proposing that as well. Um, but I'm excited for this journey to get to a point where we are just maybe looking at 
um, slight updates in the future like we have to do with certain policies that we do for the agreements. Any others? Jackie, please call the roll. Ms. Peel? Aye. Mr. Karubas? Yes. Ms. Grover? Yes. Mr. Rising? Yes. Ms. Deming? Aye. Ms. Donahue? Aye. Mr. Rasak? Aye. Motion passes. Thank you, Mr. Karius. Now move to discussion, and our first discussion item is Spanish 2 curriculum. Welcome. All right, we just tripped Mike up a little bit. <laughs> just a little bit. <laughs> Good evening. Thank you for having us this evening. Um, this is Mike Purcell, the director of uh, core curriculum for the high school, and we're here tonight to um, share with you about the Spanish two curricular revisions. We were going to show a really riveting video, but now that we've taken up time, we'll just pass on. <laughs> I can keep going. Um, the policy uh, that this is referencing is policy 640 that uh, relates to curriculum development. Um, and as we work through this evening, there is no action uh, requested. It is really for information, and then we will have the uh, revisions available for anyone to review. And then we'll come back to you on uh, May 28th in hopes of an approval for these uh, curriculum adjustments. Perfect. Thanks, Kathy. Um, the, the course that we're here to talk about this evening is Spanish 2. Uh, Spanish 2 is uh, a course where nearly 1,000 students in any Prairie 204 are enrolled, most of them freshmen and sophomores. Um, as, the, as many of the board members may recall, we have over the past five years come and talked to you and had appro board approvals for our AP Spanish course, our Honors Spanish 4 course, and two years ago our Spanish 3 course. Um, this uh, beginning at the, at the end of that uh, uh, series of um, experiences has given us a really um, nice pathway to say beginning with the end in mind, which is really our curriculum philosophy anyway, uh, but really starting with those AP themes as we'll talk about in a moment. Uh, it's given us some nice, uh, reinforced some nice purpose for us. Um, the team has come together um, to, um, over the past, uh, th since the fall, um, to come with a proposal to implement the course at the beginning of the 1920 school year. Um, the, the shifts that are really in this, uh, in the curriculum documents that we, that we'll share with you are really um, the three pieces that are, uh, how, how students communicate, uh, talk about interpersonal communication of speaking and writing, interpretive uh, communication of reading and listening, and presentational uh, communication of speaking and writing. They uh, really used two sets of documents and, and standards to really guide their work. One was the ACTVIL standards, American Council of Teaching a Foreign Language, and the, uh, the can-do statements that are supported by, by ACTFL, really those, what are those outcomes and those skills that uh, the students are and, and through the progression as they uh, acquire a new language. And then working with, uh, working with the themes um, that are promoted by the College Board and the Advanced Placement Program. What we're seeing is the work that they're doing, and uh, even in Spanish too, um, are getting students prepared, in some cases fully prepared, for the uh, test for seal by literacy. And certainly, we're looking to make sure that our Spanish students that are completing our Spanish 3 program um, successfully have uh, all of those opportunities and then can move forward towards uh, more literacy in that area in our honors Spanish 4 and the AP curriculum. Um, the, this has been a, a real team uh, effort. And, and in, in that, uh, listed out for you uh, the folks that have been doing that work, um, the, um, the teachers and the World, World Language Department chairs really have been um, this has been a really high-functioning, fun-to-work-with group. I don't understand what they're saying most of the time, um, but, uh, but, but certainly the work that they're doing and the product that they're turning out has been outstanding. We, we started this past fall with a curriculum kickoff, starting with just some of those tenets of what, what do we expect out of that and really the things that, uh, that we were just talking about, about beginning with the end in mind, what are those things we want students to know, understand, and be able to do, um, and then working on some assessment to help us to figure out how they're getting there. 
Um, and then what are those instructional design things that we can do in order to help students to get do, to meet those aims. Um, the, the Spanish two units of study uh, really fell into five units, um, each aligned to one of the specific AP themes. Unit one, uh, food, family, and cultures tied to the theme of families and communities. In that document, you'll see the essential questions that go along with each of those as well. Um, unit two, health and fitness, aligns with the AP theme of global challenges. Uh, unit three, goal or goal setting, aligns to the uh, AP theme of public and personal identities. Unit four, travel around the world, uh, ties to the AP theme of contemporary life. And unit five, fashion, uh, ties to the AP theme of beauty and aesthetics. Um, th this team has done a really nice job of, of fleshing this work out. Um, and is, is really excited to dig into those instructional design and, and designing those learning activities uh, pending board approval. Um, as um, Ms. Peace said, uh, we uh, will come back in a couple weeks to seek that approval. Wanted to give you some time to ask some questions and then to review um, the curriculum as presented. Question? So is this something that you're going to also roll into other languages like French and Chinese and yeah, sure. all the other ones that you have. Yeah, so some of that's already happened. So we've done uh, some work in, uh, in, in German not too long ago. Um, French is, uh, would be up next, so we're kind of working through this one and, and try to just kind of have a balance of those projects going. And um, so we look at, we'll look at all those languages, and, and French is certainly would be one that we would target uh, probably sooner than later. So. Ms. Peel had asked um, if this was or was not aligning to the AP. And then I think uh, Ms. Peel answered that the advanced placement things were recently updated, but you were going to kind of touch on it during this presentation. So, so basically it's, it's aligning to those AP themes? Is that, is that what I'm seeing we, from the presentation? Um, we, we really wanted to um, make sure that we're aligning our instruction to those pieces that we talked about in the shifts, right? Those pieces of communication and different aspects of communication. Moving away from, instructionally, moving away from uh, memorizing vocabulary lists and those kinds of things really towards that communication style. Obviously, vocabulary is important in that, but it's less about memorizing and more about interacting, right? Mm -hmm. in, in those ways that we described there. Um, that uh, those can-do statements uh, from Actual have Actual's really been um, sort of the guide for, for standards in that area. There's not state standards for Spanish as there are in other curricular areas, right? So the national organization, like we do in uh, lots of other uh, curricular areas, have, has been our guide. We, uh, very, uh, our, our world language department have really done a nice job of tying what Actville kind of guides them to in terms of these can-do standards with the advanced placement themes so that those things aren't new to students as if they kind of go to the end of our um, uh, rope experience. And then just one final statement. So, and I totally love that we're moving towards that interpersonal, you know, presentation mm -hmm. type of speaking, writing, or speaking, listening type of model. Um, but as we all know, that AP is very intensive as far as memorization stuff. So, I, I trust our subject matters on this, uh, our subject mm -hmm. experts on this. Um, but, you know, I, I don't want to move too far away from the, as much as we want to be, you know, the talking and collaboration, that type of thing, you also don't want to move too far away because then you lose some of that stuff that you get that you have to know for the AP too. So, but I trust the experts. So, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Other question? Can I ask you, um, how often does the AP curriculum come change? Uh, it's less predictable than you would imagine. Um, it, the um, the, the cycle uh, had been for a while, about every eight to 10 years. Um, sometimes they hit that mark, and sometimes it's, it's a little longer than that. Um, so it's, uh, it's a little bit of a guessing game sometimes. They've, they spent a lot of time uh, recently working on um, things like instruction and partnerships with Khan Academy and, and registration. They've been kind of focused on that side more, College Board has lately, than uh, curriculum revision. But, um, but the, uh, typically, we took look at eight to 10 years. Others? As we uh, develop the curriculum, uh, generally, and in this case, I think it's important that we consider parent and student input as well. Maybe that was inclu included in the video. Um, <laughs> 
but uh, I see you got the team in place, mm-hmm. um, and sometimes it might be difficult to uh, to get that input as as this is getting developed. And I know we're offering it um, to make it available, um, but based on the track record of the responses to making it available, I think we might uh, need to look at alternative means of trying to solicit input so that we get more of a response. Anyone else? I have a question. So when you're you're doing something that's not based on state standards, is it easier or more difficult to accommodate to it? Or is it basically you're coming from best practice more so? Yeah, great question. So um, if you, uh, you know, I don't know if you didn't have a great team like we did, uh, I would imagine it would be a lot harder. Uh, this team, and it seemed really easy, right? And, and the leadership that that, uh, that that group has with their world language department chairs have really done a nice job of charting a course um, that tied to re- some really crisp things. Um, and when you have a, a true north or you have a place where you want to end up, it makes things easier, whether it's state standards or something else. Um, this, jo- this team did a nice job of deciding what those things were, and then the work followed, and this team's done a great job of putting that all together. Okay, great. Um, one comment, then a question linked to that comment. Um, one of the things that I have witnessed in my family and been so proud of and happy that our district does is in middle school spreading that first year of language, French and Spanish, over that seventh and eighth grade so that we have students who are freshmen who can move into that second year of language. So as we make these changes at the Spanish two level, what are, how, how is that going to impact our seventh and eighth graders who are taking um, Spanish one now? So great question. So uh, we have uh, two pieces that are the short-term answer to that, and then uh, some pieces that will be the long-term answer to that, right? So the short-term answer to that is that our uh, world language uh, department chairs sometime um, immediately after uh, May 28th, depending on how things go, we'll go and sit with our uh, middle school s- uh, staff and just kind of make them aware of some of these changes that are coming up and some of the things that are being proposed, um, just so that they kind of know what their, where their targets are, where their kids are heading, right? Uh, we also have in, the, in August, when, when, when they return, we, we have and have over the past few years ha- used our district uh, institute day to do some 612 articulation uh, for, for French and Spanish in particular. But gen- and generally, in our sixth grade, we also have that uh, world language exploratory. Mm-hmm. So we had just a chance for all of our uh, high school world language teachers and middle school world language teachers to talk and, and, and share. Um, I also, um, you know, we've uh, following a pattern, right? We've been here for AP Spanish. Uh, we've been here for Honor Spanish 4. We've been here for Spanish 3. We're here today for Spanish 2. Um, what would come next, likely, would be Spanish 1. Um, that's all depending on priorities and budgets and things like that, but like that would likely be something that we would tackle sooner rather than later. And I, the reason, one of the reasons I asked that question is because I just want to ensure that as our Spanish one and mm-hmm. ultimately French and ultimately German, mm-hmm. as those students transition into mm-hmm. this new way of educational um, learning, that that it, that there's a nice transition, that there's not a disconnect absolutely if that makes sense yeah, we want we, them to leave middle school prepared for the next step yep. so we really encourage them to be ready and to take Spanish too in that freshman year if they've had it before so the um, collaboration with those teachers to prepare them for that is um, very important for us as well as for the students mr. Isaac yeah I, I apologize because on that subject I'm sorry to make it personal, but my daughter's in Spanish one right now in high school as a freshman. So I know they don't have a ton of times that they actually get up and speak in front of the class. So are they going to make sure that transition is good? Because as Susan was mentioning, you know, if they're going to be expected to do a lot more of this, well, they may not have had that in that one right now. So that's, yeah, I, I'm sure you guys will work on that, but that is a concern that transition too yeah so, yeah. so we're, we're certainly going to uh, be now aware and cognizant of uh, we have a pretty good sense of what the kids are doing now in Spanish right. one yep. right and so our teachers um, many of our high school teachers uh, have either taught or are teaching concurrently Spanish one so they have a pretty good idea where they where they are and certainly our, our Spanish two teachers their primary objective is to meet the kids where they're at right and then to move them through this and what we uh, think is that uh, our Spanish three teachers have been for a couple of years kind of 
in that same spot, right, where we're waiting for the Spanish two teachers, uh, Spanish two kids to be prepared a little bit differently. So, um, so they're they're Perfect. experts at that. They're doing a great job with it, and it really starts with um, w what you were just saying: is we got to know where the kids are and pick them up there, and then kind of take them to where we want them to go. And and uh, and that communication piece, you know, we'll start them as beginners and and take them from there. And it really fits with our. Um, instructional future ready instructional practices mm -hmm. is looking at the student-led conversations the student driven personalization through some of the coursework and things like that so they're not immune to that as a world language group um, they've been working through those instructional practices right along with everyone else who provides the resources is there a book <laughs> So the Spanish to uh, team curriculum team, we, we rely on them to uh, make recommendations to us on resources they like to investigate. What they uh, really are uh, adamant about is that they don't want to be tied to a textbook. They don't want to be teaching a textbook. They, they have some outcomes that they want, and they feel confident in looking at some open resource and, and teacher-created materials um, that can support that work. And then kind of along the way saying, hey, is there a... Is there a subscription, you know, is there some movies we can get? Is there some of these things that can supplement those? Uh, but they are really um, f actually passionately adamant about uh, not wanting a, a primary textbook resource uh, to support the work that they're doing here. It's really about instruction and not, they want to make it not about resource. And they agreed to that across the three high schools. So that Spanish 2 will look similar at 100%. as it does at Matea. They'll yep. still have the old resources of, reference mm -hmm. and to be able to use it for some of those opportunities as well but they're not looking to um, <clears throat> to purchase a new a totally new textbook other comments or questions thank you guys thank, thank you, you. Mr. DePaul, this is our favorite <laughs> presentation. <laughs> okay. No offense yeah, to yeah. Mr. String. Eight people watching from home. Maybe we can see. Oh my God, are you watching it? Yeah. And we're swapping out computers here. Go ahead, Todd. Thank you. Okay, it's well, our facilities update. Thank you. Thank you uh, for the opportunity to talk to you tonight, uh, Board President Razak, Dr. Sullivan, and fellow board members. Um, the presentation is in uh, board doc, so if we can do it the old-fashioned way, we may have to follow along. Um, basically, uh, tonight on page two, uh, that gives you our presentation overview. Uh, tonight we're gonna to discuss our deferred maintenance plan. Um, since we presented uh, a year ago last year, just like you and me, our buildings are another year older. Um, we'll talk about our uh, fiscal year 19 construction timelines, uh, provide specific updates on five facility areas, and talk about our next steps. Our board has recognized that over the years we have deferred many maintenance programs to either stay within budget or when we need to make, needed to make budget cuts. Last year, in order to keep us from falling further behind and to begin, begin gaining ground on these projects, you directed the administration to begin scheduling some of this def these projects that have been deferred. In September 2018, we presented you with a four-year deferred maintenance plan with the goal shown here on slide number three. Um, we wanted to reduce our deferred maintenance projects as fast as possible, um, focusing uh, on our building envelope. This is our roofs, 
our masonry walls, windows and doors, uh, also focusing on heating and cooling and safety. Uh, we needed to in ensure quality work through a manageable pace. Uh, we wanted proactively managing existing projects and uh, available resources for these projects were to come from capital outlay accounts, developer contributions, sale of property, or prior year uh, fund balance. Um, in past years, on slide number four, I've shown you a slide showing the ages of all our, of our schools and their remaining useful life. Uh, last year, one of our board members uh, called me Mr. Gloom and Doom, Doom to the amount of work that we needed to uh, <laughs> needed to do. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> so instead, <laughs> no, uh, so instead this year we want to celebrate the current age and conditions of our buildings, focusing on those buildings that had anniversaries either in 2018 or those coming up in 2019. Uh, notables for um, 2018 was May Watts that's celebrating 30 years. 20-year uh, uh, anniversaries of Gombert, Kendall, and the Krauss Education Center. Um, those coming up in 2019, Indian Plains. Uh, the original uh, two-story building was built in 1929. Uh, Clow will be 40 years old. 30-year-old uh, uh, buildings are McCarty and Springbrook, 20-year-old uh, are built to Welch, Young, and Still, and 10 years, our youngest one, will be Matia Valley. Slides five, the next two slides, um, starting with slide five, indicate the number of major capital improvement projects that we have going on in this fiscal year. As we discussed before, the time for major construction projects is limited to June and August. Uh, and this timeline uh, spans two fiscal years. Unfortunately, the summer construction season continues to shrink and we are really down to only eight weeks for construction during this timeline. This has called, caused us to bid six day work weeks and expand the number of work hours per day. Uh, looking at this uh, table, uh, the second column from the left identifies a category for the project. And we, uh, in our deferred maintenance uh, presentation back in September, we categorized projects as either special, scheduled, or deferred. Of the 17 uh, major projects that are listed on page five and six, the first six projects started in fiscal year 18 uh, and were completed in fiscal year 19. Uh, started and completed in, f in fiscal year 19 was the Varsity uh, Wabansi Valley Varsity Softball Fence Replacement Project. Uh, projects currently underway include phase five of the elementary AC project and the building automation system uh, replacement at Burkett. The first three projects identified on page six were those that you approved this evening, and we will be starting them either late this week or next week, so we're ready to go with these uh, to get these projects moving. Uh, the gym, floor, and bleacher improvement project at Wabansi uh, will begin on second shift uh, starting on May 28th, while the remaining four projects will begin when school ends in June. So as you can see, it's a very busy and tight um, Construction season, uh, these are our major projects uh, that touch parts of fiscal year 19. There are also other small projects that our staff is also completing this year. Um, if you go to slide seven, that shows the uh, well, Bonsey Valley High School varsity softball fence replacement project. Uh, this field has been there for many years, uh, but it never really had a complete fence to secure it, just like our other varsity uh, fields. Um, at Wabansi, we had a couple of challenges as a cross-country course runs through this field in, in the fall. So we had to include two 50-foot gates that could be open for a cross-country and closed for softball um, in left field and center. Um, we also uh, in 
for the first time uh, installed file poles on this field. Slide eight um, shows our roof expenses. Roof replacements are one of our highest priorities. Uh, this slide shows our expenditures over the past nine years, including our deferred maintenance projects. We we're spending over the yearly average that was recommended by EMG, who did our 2014 facility assessment. Uh, obviously, um, someone may, may ask why are we only doing two or three projects a year? And it's not reasonable to do more than two or three roof emplacements uh, in any given summer. Again, we're back to that eight-week tight construction schedule. Um, there's also other districts and other uh, companies bidding roof repair work. There just aren't enough contractors available to do more than two or three projects, and we don't have the staff to, to monitor them. Um, but as you can see, we are starting to catch up um, on our roof replacements. Slide nine shows uh, roof repair work at Longwood on the left, um, which was an extensive repair. And uh, the right <coughs> slide shows the flat roof replacement that, work on, that went on a Graham this past summer. Elementary air, air conditioning. Slide 10 uh, shows <coughs> that in August of 2019, we will complete phase five of this project. This includes installation of air conditioning units in a total of 590 uh, large classrooms in our 19 non-air conditioned buildings. And this also includes the art and music rooms uh, in these buildings along with room 107, which is located at the end of the main office area. Uh, all these rooms are included in, in the total. Uh, there are two uh, floor plans shown. One is Brookdale, which is the original elementary school prototype, and Brooks, which shows one of our traditional uh, additions. Uh, as you can see, each phase has a different color and the number of classrooms that were uh, completed in all five phases. Uh, an additional 3.3 million is needed to complete phase six of this project, which involves air conditioning the Elm C areas. Unfortunately, unlike the other five phases, this work cannot be completed on second shift during the school year. And due to the short summer construction season, may take three summers to complete this work. Oh. I'm still positive. <laughs> you were Slide uh, 11 depicts a work that uh, has either been completed or is scheduled for Wheatland Academy. Uh, the blue color identifies completed work, which includes painting in the South classrooms and the construction of the multi-purpose room and new offices uh, in the lower level. Uh, the orange and and identifies work in progress. We're working on the gym, the painting, uh, uh, is actually completed now. Uh, next is installation of wall pads, basketball backboards, and gym flooring. Uh, gym flooring is one of the bids you approved this evening. And the green work identifies that work to be completed in the north classrooms and in the organic life offices. Um, our student services uh, department has had or has held meetings with parents in the, in the south classrooms. Uh, and some of them have toured the school already. So slides 12 and 13 uh, show uh, the south classrooms. Uh, the left slide shows a classroom that's staged with furniture. Uh, this is one of the classrooms meetings has been held in. And uh, a look at the south hallways. Uh, the lower two lower level offices and a multi-purpose room uh, was created on the in the basement floor multi-purpose room is where they will have lunch um, and then this is just the beginning slide of the uh, gym painting and again that has been completed man I can't believe how good that gym looks from where that thing was <laughs> yeah, yeah it lo looks a lot bigger with all the, the, yeah. the stuff moved out to the, the 1250 uh, Shore Road building Slide 14, Grouse Education Center, turned 20 this year, as we talked about er earlier. The exterior of this building is commonly called EFIS, Drive It, or Stucco. 
where two layer cladding material is troweled over insulation. Unfortunately, um, our building envelope consultant has reviewed this building and the top layer is being worn away uh, and this building is starting to hold water or absorb water. This uh, top layer needs to be restored or we will continue to have water issues. Uh, this work is being planned for the summer of 2020. Coupled with the short construction season, it will be safer and more cost efficient to have this work being done during the summer month when the e extended school year summer preschool program is moved to another building. Uh, we will also schedule the, uh, the asphalt replacement around this building um, during the summer of 2020 while the preschool is relocated so they won't be convenienced at, at a later time. So this is something that we um, weren't really anticipating for next year, but we need to take care of. Uh, energy management initiatives. Um, last year was our first year of participation in the Internoc Demand Response Incentive Program. Uh, we presented this to you uh, a couple times uh, and reviewed it last year that um, this is a voluntary program to reduce electric, electrical usage during a critical electrical e event. In other words, when uh, these usually happen during the summer when our region's electric grid is, is for demand uh, is the highest. Uh, only the schools in the ComEd territory are eligible for this program. So none of that excludes our Naperville buildings. And we, we can only enroll schools in this program where we can have that significant drop of uh, electric. And so that is basically our two, Matia, Wabansi Valley High School, and our three middle schools, uh, Fisher, Granger, and Still. Basically, the only way to reduce this load is to turn off air conditioning. Um, if, uh, and we would only do this, it's voluntary only when students aren't, aren't present. Um, there have not been any critical electrical events called in the last five to six years. Um, the only thing that we needed to participate in was a one hour shutdown and we successfully did that for last fiscal year and this fiscal year. As part of that, uh, last year we received $52,600 for our participation in that one hour test. Um, again, we had our test for this fiscal year already. We anticipate receiving 72, or over $72,000 for that participation. The next uh, uh, hour test will come up sometime in August of 2019. Uh, we are also transitioning our exterior lighting, the parking lot, pole lights, sidewalk pole lights, wall packs, um, et cetera, from the installed metal highlight or high pressure sodium to LED lighting. The LED lighting uses much less uh, energy, lasts longer than these other types of lighting. So as they burn out, rather than replace them with the older technology, we're putting in LED uh, lights. Uh, we also were presented a proposal for installation of solar panels on the roof at Matia Valley High School. Um, several districts have gone and put solar panels on their roofs. One of the things that we need to consider first is how old are our roofs because we certainly don't want to put solar panels on a roof that we have to replace in, in the next few years. Um, Matia Valley is a prime candidate for this as they are only 10 years old. Um, we shouldn't have another 10 to 15 years of that roof. Uh, also, the solar panels are reported to uh, extend the life of, of, of the roof because they're absorbing the, the ultraviolet rays and so forth, which damages our, our rubber roofs. Um, basically, their proposal is that we would only pay for the cost of the power that these panels would be um, providing us. So it's a power purchase agreement. Um, another company would install and maintain the panels at no cost to the district. Um, the benefit for that company is for green credits, the credits in which they, they claim. 
Um, this is currently being eva evaluated by um, another energy company uh, or energy consultant um, and also our attorney. Uh, we'll be bringing more information to you in a Friday memo uh, and could be asking you for action at the next meeting in May. Um, as always, you've seen this slide before, slide 16. This is how we prioritize capital improvements and, and needs based on this hierarchy. Safety-related items are taken care of uh, ultimately first. Um, then we have uh, uh, curriculum-related needs, necessary repairs, the uh, state-required life safety projects, uh, which is building or is bringing up our older buildings to any building code changes, and aesthetics. Unfortunately, aesthetics of painting, carpet replacement, and tile replacement is the lowest priority, and we have not been able to fund these uh, projects. However, once we complete our list of deferred maintenance, we are hopeful that we will be able to shift funding to this category and start working on some of these projects also. So we appreciate your time and look forward to our next report next year. <laughs> when we're another year older. When we're another year older. Do <laughs> <laughs> we have any questions? Questions? You weren't Mr. Doom and Gloom this time, Todd. <laughs> um, so just one quick question on the, um, you said that we're looking into the uh, power purchase agreements with the solar panels and that type of thing and yes. our attorneys. And you know, I, I've talked to some of those solar companies at the, you know, the conferences and it's, they sell a great story, right? But Yes, they do. <laughs> um, I would, and I'm sure you're going to do this too, but I'd be interested in seeing what other districts are seen out of that um, across, you know, the Collar County, I guess, um, because it, I mean, there may be some recognized savings there, but again, it's all depends on those agreements. So right. um, I, I like the idea that it could save our roofs and maybe save us some money at the same time, but I look forward to that. So thanks. Sure. We talked to some of those districts and um, the feedback we get is the proposals are very complicated and confusing and you really, really need to do your due diligence and, and look at them. Yeah. There was quite a bit of discussion about Wheatland and the water um, in the past. Is there any new information about uh, um, Wheatland and the, the, the d domestic water? Yes. The um, that building is still on a well, uh -huh. um, so you do have the. The, some of the, the sulfur smells and discoloration that goes along with well water. Um, we will be bringing, as we have in the past, be uh, bringing in bottled water for drinking purposes, but it's, it's, it's uh, okay to use for hand washing and, and toilet facilities and, and so forth. It is what normally happens with well water at times. Uh, it may get a, a, a smell or a discoloration. But so what, I, what would the cost be to get on city water? Um, the city main is not, uh, is at the begin the north end of the property. Um, we would not only have to uh, uh, explore that with the city. Um, I don't have an estimate for you at this time, but we can bring that back to you. I think you did it one time. Yeah, it's had expensive. It but I'd be curious to see if neighbor will view the chimney somewhere. Yeah. Well, one of the things, too, is that the building was 1950. Um, the pipes are galvanized, so you will get some rust and discoloration even if you're on city water. Unless you replace all the pipes with the, in the building, in the walls, and so forth. Ms. Deming. Um, quick, one question. On the elementary air conditioning, can you just share, because you talked about our phases um, five years ago, but, we, but we'd actually been working on the air conditioning prior to that, before five years ago, correct? On some? No? no okay. not, not in the elementary building. Okay. No. Okay. Um, it's wonderful to see us getting to getting to that completion so thank you for the diligence on that and then um, I just wanted to point out which is 
which is wonderful that you are having an opportunity to work on one of our safety related items that was so um, important discussion during Engage 204 is our classroom lock. So thank you very much for getting to that because um, that was a priority um, during those conversations and certainly is a priority from you know the board standpoint and the administration standpoint. So thank you so much for that. Sure, you're welcome. Others? Thank you, Mr. Paul. Thank you. Um, we're moving to Board of Education discussion on proposed IASB resolutions. Um, status for me is I have not heard from anybody, but I also know that we're in the midst of a superintendent search, which has been all consuming. It's consuming and extensive, and we've also, <laughs> there's not a time I don't go to a school event and I don't see another school board member there so it's been a busy rough time at this point so anyone have any questions or concerns or still want to proceed with resolution I do I do have one um, actually I printed out it's, but it's I don't have it right here I'll share it um, when we go back to close that well just hand it out but I did um, I did want to consider a resolution um, regarding virtual learning so I will, um, I type something up and I will send it over to um, everyone and hopefully we can have discussion um, regarding it as we come to a next meeting. I'd still like to pursue that one, yeah. that, yeah, the tenth one. Okay, I, the only thing I'm gonna caution everybody with is we'll have to make some time on the 28th in order to do that, when we're doing uh, our firm interviews. So we'll have to have some time then. And then that June meeting, we're gonna have to approve it because there's a Wednesday, June 26 deadline. Mm -hmm. So I'm good with all this. It's just that I, I guess I'm telling everybody we're under a deadline that, that we have to meet. So I would like to not move forward with the TIF resolution. I think based on our capacity, um, it's a lower priority. And in drafting <coughs> the resolution for the district, um, I included a lot of the positions of IASB. And while they're not perfect and they can be updated, I think the marginal benefit on making them more accurate is is less especially when we're potentially in uh, dealing with it directly uh, so I think I, I would not want to move forward with a, a TIF resolution at this time well again each board member can bring a resolution to be considered president Razak I um, I should make a correction mine is not a resolution it would um, it's in the form of a belief statement okay so um, what how would you like what's um, how would you like me to share that or, or what, what what process would is a document well we're going to have to look at it as a board uh, at, at least in, a, in some kind of fashion probably on the 28th and then give final approval in at our June meeting and I have to see when that June meeting is. I don't have that. Ten, so we still have some time. So, so that it will have to be an agenda so item, and it will have to be on the agenda. So is it appropriate to, um, for me to attach and share through and request it? Yeah. As an agenda, okay. Anyone else? Can you share what's the difference between a resolution and a belief statement? It's just, uh, it's, it's a term, really. I mean, they, the ISBA has got different areas, so it might, the resolution kind of targets more specifics. The belief deals with generalities. Um, but in, there's an ISB 
PDF and it's on their website that kind of details all of them. Okay. Um, and so if you have a topic like virtual learning, typically what I do is I look on ISB's um, material and sometimes you find it in the belief statement, sometimes you find it in the resolution. And anytime you're going through this, you want to, you know, if I have an idea, do I need to amend what is currently existing or add on like we've done in the past? Um, so you've got to try to find out where to place it. Okay. Any other discussion? Okay. We'll be looking forward to that in the May. Um, board update. Um, LEND meeting is Friday. Um, looking forward to the vote for the new dues and fee structures. So that, um, looking forward to that. And as Dr. Um, Sullivan stated, uh, please attend that Fine Arts Festival on Saturday, 9 to 4. Um, it's a great day. Um, you see the brilliance of our students expressed in many different ways, artistically, um, musically, um, all kinds of ways, and it's free. And uh, people should take advantage of it. Um, they'll really enjoy going to one of the high schools. And you can pick your feeder school if you're in the district, but if you're a community member, I say stop by. You'll see where your tax money is being used, and you, I think you'll walk out being very, very pleased. So please join us on Saturday from 9 to 4 at each one of the high schools. With that, I need a motion to reconvene into closed session. I make a motion to reconvene into closed session. I second. I think. I think we need to. Mm -hmm. um, uh, for the Appointment, employment, compensation, discipline, performance, or dismissal of specific employees on the public body or legal counsel for the public body, including hearing testimony against on a complaint lodged against an employee of the public body or against legal counsel for the public body to determine its validity. Validity, and I think that's it. Yeah. And I think Jackie, you need to call the roll. I would if I had the slightest idea who made the motion in the second. <laughs> would that be? Just say I did since I read it. I suppose. Okay, and second? Second. Thank you. And we're withdrawing the prior motion. <laughs> I withdraw the prior motion. <laughs> Great. Okay. Um, Mr. Rising. Aye. Mr. Karubas. Yes. Mr. Razak. Aye. Ms. Peel. Aye. Ms. Deming. Aye. Ms. Grover. Yes. Ms. Donahue. Aye. And we, the motion passes, we recess into executive session.